part seven chapter four of the life of florence nightingale volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume two by edward tyus cook an indian reformer eighteen seventy four to eighteen seventy nine never to know that you are beaten is the way to victory to be before one's government is an honourable distinction what greater reward can a good worker desire than that the next generation should forget him regarding as an obsolete truism work which his own generation called a visionary fanaticism florence nightingale eighteen seventy seven miss nightingale was in one sense never more in office than when she was out of office the passion of her later life was the redress of indian sufferings and grievances and during the years eighteen seventy four to seventy nine and for many years afterwards she did an enormous amount of work to that end it was the kind of work which a minister does or sets his subordinates to do when he is getting up a subject for parliamentary debate or framing a project of legislation the milieu in which miss nightingale did this work was also in a sense official her excursions into difficult problems of indian policy and administration were regarded by many people as unsafe and inexpedient and this view was not confined to such officials as disagreed with her conclusions mr jowett was alternately overborne by her enthusiasm into trying to help her indian work and insistent upon her giving up most of it the latter attitude predominated indian land questions were not her special subjects she could never hope to know the ins and outs of them her sister was uniformly of the same opinion what can you know about such things my dear but after all how much does a minister know at first hand of the business of a department new to him generally far less than miss nightingale knew of indian business a minister either accepts the views of his subordinates or becomes himself a master of his subject by using access to the best sources of information miss nightingale to a considerable extent had access to the same sources she corresponded with successive secretaries of state and viceroys she was in close touch during many years with the permanent under-secretary sir lewis mallet who though he did not always agree with her particular conclusions was entirely sympathetic in her general aims and so far as official propriety admitted gave her every facility for pursuing her researches indian governors and ex-governors were at her service for information or discussion there is voluminous correspondence during these years with her old friends lord napier and ettrick and sir bartle frere and with new friends sir george campbell and sir richard temple with sir george a frequent visitor at south street she was especially well pleased not for years she wrote to monsieur mole august tenth eighteen seventy four have i seen a man in such heroic passion against oppression anglo-indians when in retirement in south kensington are seldom averse from imparting their views and miss nightingale had a retinue of them pleased to give her information those who had inside experience knew how much she had done for india and took it as a compliment that she should notice their work and ask them for advice except my most grateful thanks wrote general baker on retiring from the india office council october eleventh eighteen seventy five not only for your very kind letter and important pamphlet but also for one of the most complete and agreeable surprises that i have ever met with it never occurred to me for a moment that my humble efforts for the sanitation of india were so indulgently watched by the high priestess of the science colonel yule 
the member of council who succeeded sir bartle frere in the charge of sanitary affairs and mr w t thornton the secretary for public works were in frequent correspondence with her on the special subject of irrigation she was coached not only by a leading authority presently to be mentioned but by general rundle ex-inspector general of indian irrigation colonel j g fife colonel f t haig and many other experts when she turned to indian education mr a w croft the director of public instruction corresponded freely with her of her private studies there is evidence in a great accumulation of indian blue books proceedings minutes pamphlets and other papers of which many are annotated abstracted collated she had too a network of correspondence in india there were in various parts of the country sanitary commissioners doctors engineers irrigation officers who wrote to her constantly and sometimes more freely than in official reports there were occasions as in a dispute once hot now as dead as the unhappy subjects of it when her friends in the india office had to admit that her information was earlier and better than theirs so then if her friends asked why she meddled in affairs of which she could not really know anything she only set the harder to work in mastering the voluminous information at her disposal yet all the while she was out of office the conjunction of circumstances which gave her much immediate power at the war office through sidney herbert and afterwards in the earlier stages of indian sanitary reform was no longer operative and there was now disproportion between her expenditure of effort and the immediate effect which it produced in this part of her life's work miss nightingale suffered from some confusion of aim her official connections though they gave her the advantage of some good information interfered with the effect of her work as a publicist her work as a publicist made her distrusted in some official circles she would perhaps have done better to confine her exertions to the influencing of public opinion by more consistent and sustained writing the pity of it is as we shall learn presently that the book which she designed as a permanent contribution to the indian question was never completed in her lifetime still in spite of all miss nightingale's work as an indian reformer which absorbed many hours of every day in her life for twenty-five years was not without effect in various specific matters she exerted some influence at the time whilst her personal influence and her writings did something to form the public opinion which made later reforms possible Two miss nightingale's primary interest in india was in connection with sanitation and i shall give one or two instances of her resumed activity in this field before passing to the larger sphere into which that interest came necessarily to be absorbed from time to time she still intervened and not without success to promote the health of the army in india thus on july twenty one eighteen seventy four the commander-in-chief lord napier of magdala wrote to her enclosing a minute which he had been obliged to write in defence of the soldiers as improvements to barracks and in other respects were delayed year after year the minute he explained was private and confidential but he wished that the facts which had called it forth could be used in some legitimate way i cannot help telling you dear miss nightingale as i know you love the soldiers as well as you did in the crimea when you broke down the doors of red tape for them a scene which i hope to see embodied in marble before i die on receipt of this letter miss nightingale called the meeting of her indian council sir bartle frere and dr sutherland sir bartle made inquiries about the minute and found that the government of india had not yet communicated it to the india office he prepared the ground by informing the secretary of state of the fact that such a minute had been written he suggested to miss nightingale 
that without using any private and confidential information it would be possible to draw up a statement upon measures urgently needed for the further improvement of the health of the soldiers in india with the help of sir bartle frere and dr sutherland this was done and miss nightingale in council sent a dispatch to the secretary of state in disraeli's second administration lord cranbourne now become marquis of salisbury had resumed his former place at the india office miss nightingale to lord salisbury lee hurst october twenty eighth eighteen seventy four dear lord salisbury as you were so very good when you were kind enough to acknowledge my paper on life or death in india as to ask me where permission was all that i could have expected as most gracious on your part to submit any facts or suggestions to you i venture without troubling you with more apology to lay before you the following one the grasp of the famine is now relaxed though to make it relax has cost a vast expenditure with very little return except in lives other lives seem now to be in jeopardy from the economy consequent upon this noble and never to be regretted expenditure viz soldiers lives there is no greater extravagance than extravagance in lives the crown prince of germany said two months ago a very remarkable doctrine for him that we could add to the strength and numbers of organized armies by sanitary works and that money well employed in these will as much contribute to military force as money spent on fortifications and on direct military organizations a great deal has been done already in india and great results to our soldiers health have followed but does not much more remain to be done before the results of two or three favorable years for there was little cholera can become permanent does not experience show that as the greatest saving in outlay is that which can be effected in the cost of the military defences of the country so it is the truest economy not to stay your hand in improving the military stations and their surroundings until every station in india has been put in the most healthy state practicable in the meantime if it is necessary to check outlay should not the check be exercised on things that can stand over for a few years two for in reality points connected with the soldier's health cannot stand over the man is dead or invalided the man the most costly article we have and you have to replace him with another costly article is not every neglect or miscalculation on this point sure to add to the national expenditure a far higher amount than would be the capitalized cost of the improvements the improvements required now at many stations are the following a detailed list under various heads of kind and place six to you it is needless to say that this relates to one half only of the indian army that is that under the direct control of lord napier of magdala and that madras and bombay have between them at least an equal proportion of unsupplied wants for they have not had five years of lord napier's wise and humane advocacy seven in india it is always possible to fall into the mistake of spending money uselessly fortunately however there is a way out of it in the appointment of mr clark the great calcutta municipality engineer who has drained and water supplied calcutta to go out and do a similar scheme for madras detailed suggestions for further instructions to mr clark lord salisbury to miss nightingale arlington street november four eighteen seventy four dear miss nightingale i assure you we are not blind to the importance of the objects which you advocate nor are we the least inclined to interpose any unnecessary delay in their prosecution the difficulty of course is money 
it is perfectly true that if the remedies were as certain of their effect as the existence of the evils is certain and serious we might obviate the difficulty of the money by borrowing without stint but the consideration which withholds the indian government from such a course is the very fact that the remedies are by no means absolutely certain take the case of peshawar for instance a great deal of money has been spent there already and a great deal more will be spent and yet if i am to believe the reports which i receive from trustworthy authorities when all the money is spent it will still be a very unhealthy station and a very small improvement upon the death rate will ultimately be the result i heard sir george clark the other day state in council that one of the new stations in rajputana i forget which it was had become decidedly more unhealthy since remedial measures recommended by the sanitary authorities had been adopted there may be something of prejudice and something of timidity in these apprehensions i do not wish to give to them more weight than they deserve but it is obvious that in sanitary action we are still groping our way and that we are far from having arrived at that point of certainty at which it would be safe on account of any particular series of undertakings very heavily to pledge the future industry of the indian people you must always bear in mind that at this moment our expenditure treads very closely upon the heels of our revenue and that we absolutely do not know where to turn in order to obtain any great increase of revenue but if we borrowed very largely a great increase of revenue would be absolutely necessary to meet the interest of the new debt however great the value of the improvements we cannot afford to be bankrupt and a new productive indian tax seems as distant as the philosopher's stone i do not say all this to indicate that we shall slacken in our efforts toward sanitary improvement or fail to push them forward as fast as we possibly can but i want you to believe that financial considerations are of some importance and i feel sure that we should only hinder sanitary improvement and prevent sanitary truths from being heartily accepted either by statesmen or by the public at large if we associated them with a disregard of those financial exigencies upon which such enormous interests depend we must not let it be said or even suspected that sanitary improvement means reckless finance but i think the best answer i can give you to the details of your letter is to send it out to the viceroy and ask him to let me have a confidential and unofficial report of his intentions in each of these cases i am sure he feels the importance of these matters as strongly as any one but i repeat that no one can thoroughly appreciate the difficulties of his position in respect to them who does not understand the extreme anxiety that is connected with the management of indian finance no time was lost for on january two eighteen seventy five lord salisbury forwarded to miss nightingale with a private note the reply which he had received from the governor-general lord northbrook to lord salisbury calcutta december eleventh eighteen seventy four i am much obliged to you for sending me miss nightingale's letter to you and although at the risk of answering it imperfectly i will not delay putting down what occurred to me till another mail especially as one never can feel secure of one's time in india first i beg you to assure miss nightingale that i am not likely so much to forget my training under sidney herbert at the war office as to feel indifferent about the health of the soldier in india she knows as well as i do how much has been done of late years and how satisfactory the result has been as is shown by the death and sickness returns and admitted by the army sanitary commission and sir william muir the doctor in evidence recently given before a parliamentary committee miss nightingale is evidently more anxious for the future than dissatisfied with the past the best thing i can say to reassure her is that in the face of the financial difficulties of last year i left the expenditure upon military public works untouched it stands for the year at something more than a million which is as much as we can afford and nearly 
as much as can be properly supervised the year before although most anxious to show a budget which would justify me in discontinuing the income tax i gave an addition of one hundred thousand pounds to the sum allotted to military public works at the request of lord napier so much for my personal disposition and what i have done hitherto as to what remains to be done i know there is much i quite agree in principle with miss nightingale's views as to the relative importance of different sorts of works and we should be guided by the same considerations as far as possible but there are practical considerations which must interfere with their universal application for instance in many places in india owing to a want of labour we can only go on at a certain rate unless at a very greatly increased cost again it is better for many reasons to carry out all the necessary works at one station at the same time and these works may very probably include some which in themselves may not be so much wanted as other works at other stations subject to these qualifications barracks hospitals water supply and drainage should come first and recreation rooms etc follow miss nightingale has evidently carefully studied some of the details of our requirements and is not very far out in her list of works she will be glad to hear that it is not very different from that of the works the commander-in-chief has lately brought to our notice so that their relative importance is sure to be well weighed lord napier takes the liveliest interest in all the military public works and having nothing to do with finding the money is pretty sure to have no scruple in pressing us hard some of the works mentioned in the list i know myself so i will make one or two remarks detailed observations i am very glad to hear that mr clark is well enough to come out to india again when he has done his work in madras i think we may very probably ask him to advise us as to the water supply of some stations i was much taken with the apparent simplicity and economy of a plan which he showed me as regards miss nightingale's observations on the subject of recreation rooms and the sale of spirits in canteens the soldiers are uncommonly well off in india generally for recreation rooms and take advantage of them largely the reason for selling spirits at canteens is i believe that if not sold men would buy noxious spirits in the bazaars no head of the army in india has ever recommended that the sale should be prohibited the temperance movement is spreading widely among the troops in bengal by the last returns there were between five and six thousand members of the temperance society in the british army in bengal including women and children i have been struck generally with the good conduct and respectable appearance of british soldiers in india and think we may well be proud of our army i have written on as the subject is one in which i have for a long time taken a personal interest and miss nightingale may be glad to know that i have not neglected here i can promise you that so far as our funds will permit every attention shall be paid to the health of the british and the native army in india such intervention as is disclosed in the foregoing documents was repeated from time to time in connection with various sanitary measures and was not without effect in keeping those matters to the front a parliamentary debate even sometimes a mere question in parliament has effect upon bureaucracy in the times with which we are now dealing members of parliament for india were few i could have kissed lord cranbourne exclaimed miss nightingale once for saying that in the approaching elections for a parliament which is to decide on the destinies of one hundred and eighty millions the future representatives who are to represent india as well as us had only in two instances in their addresses mentioned the existence of india miss nightingale's private letters and printed articles did something to fill the gap she had the ear of the great personages they knew how much she knew and they respected her devotion and sincerity they listened to her and her letters often produced the kind of stimulating result that sometimes follows a parliamentary intervention she showed the correspondence with lord salisbury and lord northbrook to sir bartle freer that caesar he wrote 
january sixteenth eighteen seventy five should at once sit down and write six sheets of quarto letter paper to show he is taking proper care of his legions is satisfactory as proving that your letter moved him and that the subject greatly interested him the result is just what i expected wrote another anglo-indian on the occasion of a later intervention by miss nightingale they treat me with contempt but they don't ignore you the first thing the governor did on seeing your letter was to sit down and write a full exoneration of himself to the secretary of state the second i have no doubt will be to call for his officials and hurry on the work three as public health missionary for india miss nightingale made the state of the town of madras a text for constant exhortations madras ranked at that time second for unhealthiness among the great cities of india delhi being first whereas the death rate in calcutta and in bombay was falling in madras it was rising miss nightingale like every other sanitary expert who had examined the facts ascribed the high rate of mortality to the deplorable state of the drains and there were indian officials both in london and in india who turned to her in the hope that she might be able to stir up the higher authorities to insist on something being done her friend mr clark had devised a scheme either it should be carried out or a better one should be substituted on this subject there is a long correspondence amongst her papers and as her principal correspondent was lord salisbury it is not devoid of dry humour lord salisbury confessed that the subject was beyond him all he could clearly ascertain was that there were as many different opinions as there were persons professing to understand it but he had good news for his correspondent the next governor of madras was to be the duke of buckingham and the duke had a curious passion for details he might be expected it seemed to be suggested to take to drains like a rat so miss nightingale waited and presently lord salisbury was sent to the constantinople conference on the eastern question at madras nothing had come of the duke's love of detail and as soon as lord salisbury returned to england miss nightingale returned to the charge lord salisbury sent her a memorandum of suggestions to the duke and in due course forwarded to her the duke's reply of july twenty fourth eighteen seventy seven the governor was studying the question closely and lord salisbury hoped that miss nightingale would be pleased true there was delay but then as he had previously written to her the period of growth of all projects in india in point of length savours much of the periods of indian cosmogony i think you will be satisfied he now wrote august twenty two that the governor of madras is giving his mind very heartily to the question and that his previous experience and the kind of observations into which his singular taste for detail has guided him have given him some special qualifications for coming to a right decision and then came what in a postscript to the high priestess of sanitation might be thought a blazing indiscretion if it were not obviously a piece of teasing i was much impressed at constantinople with the advantage of having no drains at all but keeping dogs instead i am afraid that from the moment of the receipt of this letter miss nightingale's opinion of lord salisbury fell but she was not to be shaken off and in consultation with dr sutherland with hints to from an indian official she sent a reasoned reply to lord salisbury to his jest about the constantinople dogs erroneously called scavengers and all she had the advantage of knowing all about constantinople and the merits of its natural drainage as for madras she thought that there had been consideration enough it had lasted for more than twenty years and that the secretary of state ought to insist on action in which connection she sent various proposals lord salisbury's reply to miss nightingale did not appear to be promising the indecision of the madras government he said september nineteen is partly due to the fact that various authorities have to be consulted and no orders from the secretary of state will prevent those authorities from differing but the real difficulty he added is money it was all that the madras government could do to find money for imperious necessities the implication was that the protection of the public health was not an imperious necessity a rank 
heresy this in miss nightingale's eyes in sending on lord salisbury's letter to dr sutherland her comment was and they call me a dangerous man to which dr sutherland replied so you are they tell you a thing can't be done and you won't believe them it is all nonsense that the municipality cannot find money to drain with and no number of letters can make it sense lord salisbury's action was however more favourable to miss nightingale than his letter for it was presently announced in the madras papers that the secretary of state had ordered drainage works of some sort to be carried out at once if this were so the words at once were interpreted with some reference to the periods of indian cosmogony the scientific drainage of blacktown the most thickly populated quarter of madras was begun in eighteen eighty two that of the remainder of the town was in progress twenty-five years four miss nightingale's interest in details of sanitary reform was gradually merged into larger questions recurrent indian famines gave a new turn to her thoughts i have been doing sanitary work for india for eighteen years she explained in a letter to lord houghton november twenty seventh eighteen seventy seven but for the last four have been continually struck by this dreadful fact what is the good of trying to keep people in health if you can't keep them in life these riots are being done to death by floods by drought by zeminders and usurers you must live in order to be well this indisputable proposition appeals strongly to her emotions my mind she wrote to mr chadwick september fourteenth eighteen seventy seven is full of the dying indian children starved by hundreds of thousands from conditions which have been made for them in this hideous indian famine how i wish some one would now get up an agitation in the country as mr gladstone did as regards bulgaria which should say to the country you shall as regards indian famines and the means of preventing them among which irrigation and water transit must rank foremost if we had given them water we should not now have to be giving them bread miss nightingale had reached this conclusion by herself in eighteen seventy three and it was strongly confirmed in the following year in february eighteen seventy four she was moved to write to sir arthur cotton the greatest living master as she truly called him of the water question her letter the letter of one enthusiast to another greatly delighted the old anglo-indian if he wrote february four fifty years of hard work and contempt had produced no other return but a letter from you it would be an honour beyond what i deserve the plot is now rapidly thickening and i have not the smallest doubt that your having taken up this great subject will turn the scale it is impossible for any person not resident in india to conceive the strength of the prejudice in the minds not only of the civil officials but of multitudes out of office on both the points of irrigation and navigation in india i am assured that there is not a single person in high office now in india who is not in his heart opposed to them both but we have arrived at a most remarkable crisis now first in the occurrence of this most terrible famine and second in the revolution in the india office lord salisbury will think for himself in spite of an indian council composed with only the exception of sir b frere of men of incurable old indian bias sir arthur cotton's inventive genius has left a permanent impress upon india but he was now en disponibilite and he was one of those enthusiasts who when out of office and unable to carry on their plans conceive the world to be in wilful conspiracy against them moreover in urging the case for canals he overstated it by too uncompromising a criticism of railways during ensuing years sir arthur cotton was one of the most voluminous of miss nightingale's correspondents she was fully alive to the faults of manner which hindered the acceptance of his ideas and from time to time she pleaded with him for more moderation and less asperity 
she herself was sometimes blamed by mr jowett and others for over-emphasis she would laughingly wonder in reply what they thought of sir arthur cotton who gave the public strong alcohol in comparison with which anything of hers was but watered milk she had not far pursued her researches into the irrigation question before she perceived that it was intimately bound up with the land question who was to pay for irrigation were the riots willing to pay a water rate could they pay it were not the zeminders rapacious was not the cultivator at the mercy of the usurers sir george campbell was full of such subjects and miss nightingale proceeded with his assistance to master the intricacies of land tenure in various parts of india and especially of the permanent settlement in bengal one subject led her on to another and she became deeply interested in the questions of representation land education usury she became in short an indian reformer or an indian agitator at large end of an indian reformer one two three four part seven chapter four of the life of florence nightingale volume two this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 2 by Edward Tyus Cook. An Indian Reformer Continued, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Her immediate effort, however, was thrown into the advocacy of irrigation in view alike of the poverty of india and of the ever-present danger of famine she held that it was the duty of the government to promote irrigation in every way by great works as well as small by wells and tanks as much as by great and small canals by encouraging private capital as well as by making great national grants and loans the indian taxpayer was poor it was said to her the way to make him less poor she replied was to irrigate his land miss nightingale began her irrigation campaign with an appeal to lord salisbury and she approached him on a point which she thought would be common ground she knew that he was of a scientific turn of mind and hoped he would agree with her that the first thing needful was to obtain complete and trustworthy statistics she sent him some tentative figures as to the cost of irrigation works already carried out and the financial results accruing therefrom confessing however that she had experienced great difficulty in obtaining the figures i have been too long on the search for such returns myself he replied may tenth eighteen seventy five not to sympathize with your distress he proceeded at some length to enumerate the difficulties in the way of a really rigorous exhibit and to state the questions which seemed to him still unsolved with regard to irrigation in general for instance is irrigation he asked the creation or merely the anticipation of fertility does it make vegetable wealth which but for it would never have existed or does it crowd into a few years the enjoyment of the whole productive power of the soil meanwhile he had her figures submitted to critical annotation at the india office directed various papers to be sent to her and promised to see whether fuller returns could be obtained as nothing definite resulted miss nightingale suggested the appointment of a committee or commission to investigate and report the suggestion elicited a characteristic reply from lord salisbury as for a commission he wrote november one eighteen seventy five i doubt its efficiency commissions are very valuable to collect and summarize opinion and they are often able to decide one or two distinct issues of fact but they are too unwieldy for the collection and digestion of a great variety of facts and figures with the best intentions their work is slow and routinier and in their report they gloss over the weak places with generalities as a rule administrative force is in the inverse proportion of the number of men who exercise it one man is twice as strong as two two men are twice as strong as four 
boards and commissions are only contrivances for making strong men weak from time to time she jogged lord salisbury's elbow asking whether he had yet been able to obtain trustworthy figures and beseeching him to initiate a great irrigation policy do not for a moment imagine he wrote february twenty seventh eighteen seventy six that i have forgotten the question the more i go into it the deeper the mystery appears every one who has a right to entertain an opinion on it vindicates that right by entertaining a different one from his neighbour general strachey and sir barrow ellis have been engaged upon the matter for years both of these assert with confidence that one set of statements is true while the government of india backed by mr thornton our excellent public works secretary assert it with no less confidence to be false when i am able to get a little light i will let you know but as long as my oracles flatly contradict each other i am not likely to get nearer certainty than i am now as lord salisbury was disinclined to a committee of experts she begged him to procure returns from india and she drew up a model form of inquiry on which particulars might be asked of the extent of cultivated land in each district the amount of land under irrigation the cost of annual repairs and so forth and so forth lord salisbury took the suggestion into consideration and some returns were called for but nothing came of it for the time miss nightingale then tried to obtain information in another way there were she was told masses of data in the india office itself which only needed analysis and tabulation to yield valuable results lord lawrence had introduced to her mr edward princep late settlement commissioner punjab as a man likely to be helpful in such work she made friends with him sir lewis mallet gave facilities and mr princep began making researches on miss nightingale's behalf unfortunately for her success she had the correctitude to ask lord salisbury's permission lord salisbury referred her request to the revenue department who in a solemn minute represented the serious precedent that would be set by allowing an outsider to delve in official archives and mr princep had to discontinue his researches you are doubtless aware sir lewis mallet told her dryly that in the india office opinions diametrically opposed are usually entertained on every subject which is discussed there was only one certainty he added that any decision taken at one time would be reversed at another ultimately a good deal of information was collected by a select committee of the house of commons on public works in india eighteen seventy eight and by famine commissions returns such as miss nightingale asked for are now regularly made some irrigation works were carried out during these years but no great forward policy in that direction was instituted the forward policy presently adopted was of a very different sort the thoughts of the politicians were absorbed in other things the opinions of the bureaucrats were divided and there was stringency in indian finance if the experts could not agree on the proper basis of estimating the results of irrigation still less were they at one on the kind of irrigation work that was desirable every one was agreed in favour of irrigation in principle but as soon as it became a question of detail whether in finance or in engineering there were as many opinions as there were experts one school said borrow the money and the land will be so enriched that the riot will be able to pay increased taxation another school retorted but he will be squeezed out of existence first therefore retrench all round and wait for better times or if the financial difficulty were overcome engineering difficulties were raised one school said make navigable canals but that meant fullness of water in them another said make canals primarily for irrigation but that meant depletion and so the controversy continued with no decided impulse from the men in office famines came and went some works were carried out as a form of relief no great preventive policy was established miss nightingale was much disheartened but she persevered 
she corresponded with everybody of importance whom she could hope to influence with lord lytton who had succeeded lord northbrook as viceroy in eighteen seventy six she was not acquainted and lord beaconsfield she never approached except on another matter and then without any encouragement on his part in april eighteen seventy eight lord salisbury became foreign secretary and was succeeded at the india office by mr gaythorne hardy lord cranbrook mr edward stanhope becoming under secretary mr stanhope came to see her june eighteen seventy eight and in the following year she sent him the figures of mortality in the last indian famine which she had compiled with great labour from various sources of information and correspondence ensued she saw and corresponded largely with sir james caird the english representative on the famine commission she tried to incense lord houghton on the subject of indian grievances she saw and corresponded with mr fawcett she saw mr bright she kept up a large and regular correspondence with officials in india she supplied materials for lectures in england and with skilled assistance she had some maps drawn and engraved to show the principal works which might be constructed these maps did service at lectures and miss nightingale also wrote repeatedly in newspapers and magazines heralding water arrivals pointing out districts which famine had not visited owing to previous irrigation and others where similar works might be expected to prevent famine in future comparing the cost of relief and prevention urging the importance of extending education calling attention to oppression in forms of land tenure and by money-lenders and generally seeking to arouse public interest at home in the life and sufferings of the voiceless millions in india the piece by miss nightingale which attracted most attention was an article on the people of india in the nineteenth century for october eighteen seventy eight sir james knowles's magazine was then in the early days of its influence and he gave the first place to this article in which miss nightingale administered a wholesome shock to british complacency we do not care for the people of india she exclaimed the saddest sight in the world was to be seen in the british empire it was the condition of the indian peasant she gave pitiable facts and figures of indian famines and passed on to describe in more detail the evils of usury in the bombay deccan i cannot tell you she wrote to a correspondent in the following year the intense interest that i take in the subject how to raise the indebted poor cultivators of india out of their wretched bondage of poverty whether by mont de piete by some national bank such as you propose by some cooperative system or by all or any of such means miss nightingale's article was received as a kind of manifesto by those who sympathized with her point of view and the publication brought a large accession to her indian correspondence in official circles it caused some flutter i have read your article wrote a friend in the india office august eighth with the greatest interest and admiration the official mind is much disturbed i overheard a conversation between two magnates not in the present government in which the article was described as a shriek and the question was whether something could not be done to counteract the impression lord northbrook after reading the article sent to miss nightingale an elaborate criticism not traversing her case in all points but pleading that she had exaggerated the shadows with lord salisbury's successor at the india office there was the following correspondence miss nightingale to lord cranbrook august tenth eighteen seventy eight dear lord cranbrook very meekly i venture to send you a poor little article of mine on the people of india in the nineteenth century i hope if you read it you will not call it a shriek i am astonished at my own moderation i am not so troublesome as to expect that you can find time to read it but the india office has untold treasures which it does not know itself in reports on these subjects which will engage your busy time and especially the deccan riots commission report on the relation of the riots and the extortionate money-lenders in the bombay deccan 
will i am sure call for your attention can there be any private enterprise in trade or commerce in manufacture or in new interests when to money-lenders are guaranteed by our own courts the profits the enormous and easy profits which no enterprise of the kind that india most wants can rival what are the practical remedies for extortionate usury in india and principally in the bombay deccan the bill now before the legislature at simla does not seem to promise much does it the whole subject is i know before you pray believe me with some wonder at my own audacity ever your faithful and grateful servant florence nightingale lord cranbrook to miss nightingale india office august thirteenth eighteen seventy eight dear miss nightingale having been out of town for two days your note only reached me this morning i read your article last week with much interest but without underrating the griefs of india i think you generalize too much from one locality nevertheless there is enough to stir the heart and mind in search of remedies for admitted evils yours very sincerely cranbrook the secretary of state wrote to the viceroy lord lytton in much the same sense calling his attention to miss nightingale's article saying that she had generalized too much but adding i shall be truly glad if your legislation can afford a remedy the viceroyalty of lord lytton was more famous however for the forward policy in afghanistan than for internal reforms miss nightingale as a disciple of lord lawrence was wholly opposed to an aggressive policy which moreover had the effect of causing retrenchment in all departments except the military six miss nightingale in her propagandist zeal now turned to mr gladstone she made an article of his called friends and foes of russia which appeared in the nineteenth century january eighteen seventy nine the occasion of a letter to him in this article he had incidentally referred to the loss of one million four hundred thousand lives in the last indian famine she pointed out to him that his estimate was far below the truth and she sought to enlist him in a crusade for the indian causes dear to her heart mr gladstone to miss nightingale howarden january twenty sixth eighteen seventy nine how many years have elapsed since your name used to sound daily in my ears and how many sad events events of varied sadness have happened in the very place where i used to hear it all through this eastern controversy the most painful of my life it has been a consolation to know that i was in sympathy with you especially i remember your most striking declaration about the war against turkey i am glad that you approve of my article on the friends and foes of russia glad that the error you notice is one of understatement i had not the means of complete reference when i sent off the sheets and one million four hundred thousand seemed to me so awful that i trembled lest i should be overstating the first correction i received put four millions and now you raise it higher still the indian question under most vicious handling is growing gigantic and most perilous depend on it i will do what i can in it but i fear this must be little i fear that apart from other reasons weighty enough my taking a leading part in it would at once poison its atmosphere now that it has come to be a main ground of the controversy between government and opposition when i dealt with the vernacular press act last year there was no indian controversy and i took all the care in my power not to treat it as a contentious question all this is now changed and whatever i recommend about india the tories will oppose you can hardly be aware of the extraordinary degree in which prejudice and passion have gathered round my very name as well i am bound to say as favour and affection since the eastern question came up whether by my fault or not i can hardly say but such is the fact in the line i have followed i must steadily persist to the end of the conflict but i have all along foreseen the likelihood that it would probably disable me even if age and other circumstances did not for rendering any other serious public service in the way of acting which it must always be remembered is so different from that of objecting and censuring 
the whole indian question will however force itself forward and there will be plenty of hands to deal with it mr bright is coming here in two days and i hope to have full conversation with him about it believe me with warm regard and respect sincerely yours w e gladstone miss nightingale continued the correspondence and presently mr gladstone called upon her to talk over indian affairs which were now beginning to assume some importance in his general campaign against the policy of lord beaconsfield mr gladstone's visit was in may on june twenty sixth lord lawrence died and miss nightingale was deeply moved miss nightingale to mr gladstone july sixth eighteen seventy nine i see you were at lord lawrence's funeral yesterday and you may care to hear the story of his last days from one who has been privileged to know and serve with two such men as sidney herbert and john lawrence very different but alike in the one thing needful the serving with all their souls and minds and without a thought of self their high ideal of right lord lawrence's last years were spent in work he did not read he studied though almost blind he waded with the help of a private secretary who was a lady through piles of blue books chiefly but not wholly indian bringing the weight of his unrivalled experience to bear upon them up to tuesday night though very ill he died on friday he worked on the thursday before he had spoken in the house of lords on the indian finance question the disease tedious and trying of which he died was brought on by the london school board work he used to come home quite exhausted saying that he could have done the thing himself in half an hour yet having entered with a patience very foreign to his nature into all the niggling crotchets of everybody on the board he gave the impression i believe of sternness in public but the tenderness and the playfulness of his intercourse in private were beyond a woman's tenderness he was a man of iron he had gone through forty years of indian life in times of danger toil and crisis had been brought seven times to the brink of the grave and had weathered it all to die of a school board at last he had the blue eye and the expression in it before his operation of a girl of sixteen and the massive brow and head of a general of nations rather than of armies i received a letter from him the day after his death dictated but signed by himself sending me some recent indian reports private papers which he had read and wished me to read all marked and the page turned down where he had left off this was his legacy oh that i could do something for india for which he lived and died the simplicity of the man could not be surpassed the unselfishness the firmness it was always is it right if it was it was done it was the same thing its being right and its being done a photograph was taken a few hours after death if it had been a sketch by caracci or leonardo or michelangelo we should have said how far art transcends nature in the holiest pictures of the old masters i have never seen anything so beautiful or so holy the lips are slightly parted like those of a child in a rapture of joy on first awakening with a childlike joy at entering into the presence of the heavenly father whom he had served so nobly and so humbly the poor eyes are looking down but as if they were looking inward into the soul to realize the rapture like milton's and joy shall overtake him like a flood the face is worn i think sometimes the youth the physical beauty in the old italian pictures of christ do not give the full meaning of it behooved him to have suffered these things that he might enter into his glory or else like titian's monita it is the mere ascetic but here it was the joy arising out of the long trial the cross out of which came the crown the expression was that of the winged soul the child's soul as in the egyptian tomb paintings rising somehow without motion spiritually out of the worn-out body he said on the sunday i can't tell you how i feel i feel worn out all india will feel his loss no one now living knows what he did there in private i mean as well as in public the raising of the people by individuals as well as by institutions the letters and messages from sikhs to him the indian gentlemen who used to come to see him here and treated him as their father the little curs here have barked and bit round the heels of the old lion 
he heard them but he heeded not and now he is gone to undertake yet greater labours to bless more worlds in the service of god lady lawrence wished to give every one something which had belonged to his personal use but it was found he had nothing there were some old clothes and a great many boots patched but nothing else not even a pin except his watch twenty years old and his walking-stick which she kept the lady who served as his secretary after his blindness had his old shoe-horn and told me this story with an infinite relish of its beauty it was so characteristic of him pardon me if i have taken up your time with my thoughts of john lawrence i felt as if i were paying him a last tribute in commending his memory to you seven oh that i could do something for india she had done much and was yet to do more but it was a constant regret of her later years that she had failed to carry through one piece of work which she had planned this was a book on the allied questions of indian irrigation and indian land tenure to which in her first draft she had given the fanciful title the zamindar the sun and the watering pot as affecting life or death in india miss nightingale had first written the book in eighteen seventy four and she had several copies privately printed the earliest copies are prefaced by the following notes on dramatis personae they introduced besides the minister on whom at this time she pinned her hopes her principal informants and they show the spirit of the book the marquis of salisbury a real workman and born ruler of men secretary of state for india by the grace of god sir george campbell ex-lieutenant governor of bengal gulliver among the lilliputians sir arthur cotton r e the most perfect master of the water question living colonel rundle r e head of water department at bengal then of all india now at home colonel haig r e head of water department of bengal now at home ill the zaminder created landlord out of tax gatherer growing rich the riot created slave out of landowner or privileged cultivator starving for while wealth accumulates men decay mr jowett revised the book many times and among the first things which he cut out was the characteristic dramatis personae his unfavourable opinion of the book as a literary work prevented the publication of it in eighteen seventy four the style he wrote august eleventh eighteen seventy four is too jerky and impulsive though i think it is logical and effective he must avoid faults of taste and exaggeration the more moderate a statement is the stronger it is but strength lies in paragraphs in pages in the whole not in single sentences the form should appear to flow irresistibly from the facts and reasonings what does the man mean by talking to me about style when i am thinking only of the sufferings and oppression of one hundred million of riots yes but if you want to make the english people think about the riots you must be careful of the least indiscretion or exaggeration you must make style a duty and then your book will last and again i find myself amid striking expressions but i do not know where i am he told her that she must rewrite the whole thing before publishing it he offered to help her and drew out a more methodical scheme but she was impatient of his passion for making heads besides his heads do not cover the ground that i must cover and do cover ground that i don't want to cover she was disheartened and laid the book aside for a while but at various times during the following years she resumed work upon it the book was in two parts the first dealing with the land question and being a plea for a reform of the permanent settlement with an appendix largely contributed by m mole on prussian austrian and russian reforms in abolition of servitude the second part dealt with irrigation as affecting life or death in india with an appendix of statistical data for the first part she had prepared a series of illustrations of indian agricultural life and customs many of the woodcuts were from sketches by the son of her old friend sir renald martin for the second part she had prepared the irrigation maps already mentioned meanwhile the tables of statistics which she had compiled had owing to the delay become out of date some of her friends sir bartle frere and sir george campbell and sir arthur cotton urged her to revise the book and publish it 
and there are in existence a series of proofs in various stages and belonging to various years corrected by the three friends just mentioned and by many others lord lawrence too had read the book carefully and one of his last letters to miss nightingale contained a full discussion of many of the points involved in it clearly the book first written in eighteen seventy four required in eighteen seventy nine large revision and she could not bring herself to do it in later years she used some of the material in other ways it served indeed as a quarry for many articles papers and private letters but she never ceased to regret that she had not been able to leave in permanent literary form her views on the questions discussed in the book in her will made in eighteen ninety six she left special provision for the publication of such part if any as her executors might think fit of the books papers whether manuscript or printed and letters relating to my indian work together with two stones for irrigation maps of india and also with the woodcut blocks for illustration of those works by those works i take it that she meant principally the book written in eighteen seventy four i do not know whether her suggestion would be carried out if it were much revision and editing would be necessary indian reform moves it is true at a rate which savours much of the periods of indian cosmogony but yet it moves there is a good deal in miss nightingale's published and unpublished writings about india which might be collected and still serve as tracts for the times but there is at least as much which is now happily out of date of the reform of the bengal land system projected by lord ripon and carried into effect by lord dufferin we shall hear something in a later chapter some of the principal irrigation works which miss nightingale advocated were presently carried out with success and to the great benefit of the country notably the swat river canal eighteen eighty five the chenab canal eighteen eighty seven and the jhelum canal nineteen o two her irrigation map brought up to date by statistics at the india office was published in nineteen hundred and maps brought up to a later date are accessible twenty years after the date of miss nightingale's paper on the people of india the area irrigated by productive canals had increased from five million acres to nine and a half million and since nineteen o one a consistent policy of preventive irrigation has been adopted the policy of introducing some element of representation and of admitting the natives of india more largely to administrative and judicial posts has slowly but steadily progressed since the years when miss nightingale turned her attention to such questions eight on all these matters miss nightingale suffered much disappointment and felt great impatience the positive and statistical bent of her mind inclined her to the conviction that for every acknowledged evil there must be a definite remedy she wanted a positive policy clearly laid down and immediately carried out the attitude of successive secretaries of state and governments of india in the years under consideration in this chapter was different there is a state paper in which lord salisbury when secretary for india wrote a philosophic defence of the policy of drift the immediate reference in the paper was to the land question in madras but its argument is applicable to larger ground it is entirely in keeping as the reader will observe with lord salisbury's letters to miss nightingale on the subject of irrigation in india we must be content to contribute our might towards a gradual change sir george campbell appears to dread this gentle mode of progression which he denounces under the name of drifting i cannot accept the metaphor in its entirety for i believe that there is still left some though not a very important influence for the helm but with this reservation i see no terror in the prospect of drifting on the contrary i believe that all the enduring institutions which human societies have attained have been reached not of the set design and forethought of some group of statesmen but by that unbidden and unconscious convergence of many thoughts and wills in successive generations to which as it obeys no single guiding hand we may give the name of drifting it is assuredly only in this way that a permanent solution of these difficult questions will be given to the vast communities of india the vacillation of purpose the chaos of opinion we are now deploring only indicate that the requisite convergence has not yet been attained when statesmen assume only an unimportant influence on the helm the need is the greater for independent workers to guide public opinion in a definite direction in eighteen seventy nine miss nightingale thought that her work as an indian 
reformer had failed but she is entitled to an honourable place among the company of clear thinkers who prepared public opinion for the era of indian reform which was inaugurated during lord ripon's viceroyalty and whose persistent advocacy helped to produce at last the requisite convergence of opinion in favour of irrigation as the best if not the only or all-sufficient preventive of famine the fanaticism which she shared with sir arthur cotton is not now so visionary as it once seemed lord napier she wrote calls sir arthur cotton a splendid madman and so he is but all these must be splendid madmen who initiate any great thing any great work which does not recommend itself to the present knowledge or ignorance of minds which do not see so far as the splendid madmen of this age who will be sensible men to the next age and perhaps a little in arrear to the age after that end of an indian reformer continued five six seven eight part seven chapter five of the life of florence nightingale volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume two by edward tyus cook home life in south street and the country one two three four life made straight on purpose to make sweet the life at large browning you live said lord napier and ettrick in calling upon miss nightingale one day between a palace and a park and have one of the best views in london a pilgrim who makes his way to number ten south street and looks up to the tall unpretentious house now marked by a tablet recording the residence of florence nightingale in it will not see the palace and may wonder how she can have had any view at all the principal rooms however are at the back of the house and on the upper floors command a view of the park across the grounds of dorchester house the finest of london's italian palaces miss nightingale was fond of the view especially in spring mornings but in the afternoons she moralized her landscape in a letter to her father from south street she quoted samson agonistes eyeless in gaza at the mill with slaves since i have lived looking on the park and seen those people making their trivial round or rather their treadmill round blind slaves to it i have scarce ever had that line out of my head it will be a material alleviation to me if i have to spend september in london that the mill is gone also though my whole life is laid out to secure it against interruptions no one could believe how much it is interrupted and september diminishes this the beggars are out of town how strict was miss nightingale's rule against interruption even from her best friends is shown amusingly in some notes of this date from lady ashburton and her daughter i wish wrote lady ashburton that you would let me sit like a poor old rat in the corner while you are at dinner it is much wholesomer not to eat in solitude but i know i shan't get in so i can only leave this at the door mother bids me add a p s to my letter and ask with her dear love if you could see her any time to-day she will talk through the keyhole and not detain you five minutes the nicest little house in london number ten was called by lady verney whose own house was only a few doors off the proximity did not altogether facilitate florence's measures for security against interruption there was underlying affection between the sisters but at times each was acutely conscious of the other's shortcomings also each thought that the proximity was more valuable to the other than to herself number ten had been taken by mr nightingale on the advice of sir harry and lady verney who thought it would be well for florence to be near them 
florence on her part felt that she was often very useful to her sister their common friend madame mole was sometimes in perplexity to decide which sister's hospitality to accept go to the verneys if you prefer wrote florence on one occasion but we shall have to do for you all the same you know what her housekeeping is we shall have to send in clean sheets and food and scrub down the floors in one respect the proximity of the two houses was certainly convenient to florence sir harry and lady verney took a willing share as we shall hear presently in the entertainment of florence's nursing friends and sir harry the chairman of the council of her training school was within easy call she was not however accessible at all times in person either to her sister or to her brother-in-law any more than to others much of the communication between them was by letter or message in later years however a morning visit from sir harry was part of the day's routine when still in full health he was one of her chief links with the great world bringing her its news and carrying out her behests with pride and alacrity he was her senior by nineteen years and he lived to be ninety-three in his old age one of his great consolations was a morning call upon his sister-in-law during which they read together in some religious book of his choosing he was of the old evangelical school but in such matters except in opinion they did not disagree two miss nightingale's manner of life made her messenger an important member of the south street staff she had taken a great and liberal interest in the corps of commissionaires established in eighteen fifty nine and a commissionaire was in her regular service acting both as cerberus and mercury miss nightingale's messenger must have been a familiar figure with his notes for dr sutherland at the war office and for the matron at st thomas's hospital for the rest miss nightingale kept a staff of maid-servants her own particular maid for many years was temperance hatcher but at the time with which we are now concerned she had married one of miss nightingale's crimean protégés peter grillage who for some years had been a man-servant at embley miss nightingale was much attached to this exemplary pair constantly sent presents to them and their children corresponded with them almost to the end of her life and remembered them in her will at an earlier date mr jowett in letters written after visits to miss nightingale letters known as roofers by the younger gown refers gratefully to the care of neat-handed temperance miss nightingale took infinite pains in the selection of her maids kind mrs sutherland did much of the work in this sort for her and when she was away in the country mrs sutherland was often asked to keep an eye on south street miss nightingale's love of method and precision her fondness for having everything in black and white appear in many a formidable schedule of duties and requirements which she drew up for the information of applicants perhaps these had the effect of weeding out the unfit for with some exceptions miss nightingale was well served as was meet and right for good mistresses make good servants and she was solicitous of their comfort and welfare she was an excellent housekeeper and here again she brought into play the methodical and critical habits which she had practised in larger spheres i have seen a book in which a young cook entered the day's menu and on the following morning the mistress wrote comments on each course for the most part kindly and encouraging but sometimes trenchant as in this note upon stewed cutlets why was the glue pot used or in this upon a dish of minced veal meat hard and remember that mincing makes hard meat harder miss nightingale was a small though delicate eater it was for her visitors that she took most pains cakes of different kinds fresh eggs and coffee used to be sent regularly to st thomas's hospital to two wards every week and meat souffles and jelly were sent weekly to two invalids at lea hurst and one at liverpool if a nursing friend was coming to south street who was likely to want feeding up or suffering from overwork would require to have her 
appetite coaxed miss nightingale would draw up the menu herself and write out her own recipes for particular dishes she had not served in the east with the great sawyer in vain her father after his first visit to south street pronounced florence's maids and dinner perfect and the crown princess going down to lunch by herself after seeing miss nightingale sent word that the luncheon was a work of art three of miss nightingale as a hostess and of the pleasures of south street to her nursing visitors one of her pupils who was often invited gives this account early tea if you would accept it was brought to you and following close upon the housemaid came miss nightingale's own maid to inquire how you had slept and then to ask if you had any plans for the day or would like any visitor invited to lunch or otherwise when this had been ascertained there came by note or message proposals for the vacant time and an hour was appointed for your visit to her that is for the visit in chief for you might have other glimpses of her during the day she was always on the lookout to make your visit not only restful and restoring by all manner of material comfort but to make it interesting and brightening as well if the verneys were in residence at number four miss nightingale laid them under contribution for our entertainment and right kindly did they both respond sometimes the guest went there to dinner dining alone with sir harry and spending the time before and after with lady verney then in some degree an invalid in the drawing-room the conversation there was amusing relating to a world not centred in hospitals for sir harry loved to talk of his early days in france and spain lady verney would sometimes take you driving with her and as she was of the great world you were likely to have a peep at its attractions perhaps the carriage would be stopped while she chatted with dean stanley or it would pause to allow of cards being left at some great house then lady verney would turn and tease her guest from the hospital about coming to town in the season and leaving cards at the french embassy or sir harry would include you in his party going to visit miss octavia hill in her london courts and houses not at all resembling the embassy or he would take you to the house of commons when the irish members were lively and you would see mr gladstone mr trevelyan and mr parnell and have an exciting story to bring home to the chief or it might be that you were taken to a meeting of the royal geographical society where stanley surrounded by dr moffat sir samuel baker and other great travellers was telling a crowded audience amid breathless silence how he crossed the dark continent but these pleasures which miss nightingale lavished on her workers and in which she shared only by sympathy were not the event of the day to her visitor the chief privilege was always the interview with herself it was usually arranged to begin at half-past four and often lasted through several hours sometimes with a short interval at times miss nightingale was well enough to come down to the drawing-room and rest on a couch there while she received her guests couch or bed was always strewn with letters and papers and a pencil was ever at hand it was cheerful to find her on the couch relieved from the imprisonment of the bed she was dressed then in soft black silk with a shawl over her feet always the transparent white kerchief laid over her hair and tied under the chin the transparent white kerchief was an exquisite little curtain of fine net edged with real lace often very fine for miss nightingale was of the old-fashioned persuasion that a gentlewoman cannot wear imitation lace some of her lace was buckinghamshire made in cottages near claydon whether sad or glad there was a bright smile of welcome once or twice i found her with her persian kittens about but they were soon dismissed if you had come only for the interview on business that might occupy all the time though even on such occasions business might be dispatched in time for other pleasant talk but if you were staying in the house though business was discussed and counsel given a wide range was allowed to other conversation naturally you gave 
gave her an account of the day's doings she entered into them with zest and was led on to other subjects sometimes she would speak of india and the riots sometimes of egypt and the fellaheen it was rare for her to touch upon the crimean episode if she did so it was generally to speak with affectionate remembrance of mrs bracebridge miss nightingale encouraged her pupils to speak at these interviews and it was a common matter of self-reproach with me that whereas i went desirous and resolved to listen i had occupied too much of the time talking however it was perhaps her design and gave her the best opportunities of helping her pupils she listened to all one said with an open mind and made much of any point of which she approved but now and again she flashed out a dissent in a tone of maternal authority and gave you a forcible exposition from the point of view of her powerful intellect and wide outlook she was enthusiastic but she was not a prey to illusions sometimes when there was not a clear contradiction there was a quiet questioning indeed many of her lessons were given in the form of questions among our happiest subjects of conversation were the children in the hospitals miss nightingale seemed never to weary of hearing of them of their sufferings their home circumstances their pathetic knowledge of life their heroic patience their quaint sayings their brave fun in intervals of ease their interest in one another their thousand sweetnesses not the less was her sympathy given to the older patients while the nurses had if possible a still larger place in her regard Four the room in which these treasured interviews took place was either the drawing-room or miss nightingale's bedroom on the second floor both at the back of the house the bedroom had a crescent-shaped outer wall with pleasant french windows and flower balconies the bed stood between the windows and the door with its foot facing the fireplace and behind the bed was a long shelf conveniently placed for books and papers there were always flowers in the room those in pots on a stand were provided by mr rathbone as already related until his death and a box of cut flowers was sent every week from melchett court by lady ashburton the walls were white and there were no blinds or curtains the room seemed full of light and flowers what impressed visitors was the exquisite cleanliness and daintiness of all the appointments which served as the frame to their mistress it always seemed a beautiful room says one visitor but there was very little in it beside the necessary furniture which was neat but cheap and simple except a few pieces which had come from embley and lea hurst a large arm-chair in which miss nightingale would sometimes sit stood between two of the three windows there were few pictures on the walls a photograph of lord lawrence's portrait a water-colour of an egyptian sunset and one or two other gifts the two things of most meaning were a long chromolithograph of the ground about sebastopol as she called it in her will this was opposite her on the right and on the mantelpiece exactly facing her bed a framed chromolithographed text it is i be not afraid the drawing-room was loftier and more severe and on the walls were some fine engravings and photographs of the sistine ceiling there were many bookcases in the drawing-room the back drawing-room and the dining-room mostly full of blue books as a little girl i spent many hours in the dining-room while my mother was upstairs and can bear witness that except blue books the only reading was the ring and the book occasionally miss nightingale would be seen standing or moving about in her room what was then remarked was the grace and dignity of her bearing though the willowy figure which distinguished her in earlier years had now become large more often she received her visitors in bed or on her couch what they then observed was the head the face the hands her head in girlhood and early womanhood had been remarked as small possibly it had grown somewhat and something must be put down to the increased size of the face as affecting the appearance 
but at any rate her head in later years was certainly large an army surgeon who visited miss nightingale frequently in the eighties and nineties tells me that he was always struck by the massiveness of the head comparable he thought to mr gladstone's there was an unusually fine rounded form of the forepart of the head just above where the hair begins the eyes were not specially remarkable though there was a suggestion of intellectual keenness in them the nose was fine and rather prominent the mouth small and firm the hands were small and refined every one who saw her felt that he was in the presence of a woman of personality of marked character energy and capacity as her visitor entered miss nightingale would bend forward from her bed or couch with a smile of welcome the visitor would be invited to an easy chair beside her and talk would begin in her youth miss nightingale was a brilliant talker as witnesses cited in an earlier chapter have told us in later years too she had flashes of brilliance madame mole whose standard was high wrote to her husband from lea hurst in eighteen seventy three mr jowett spent three days here he is a man of mind i think he would suit you he is very fond of flow which also would suit you she is here and her conversation is most nourishing i would give a great deal for you to be here to enjoy it she is really eloquent yesterday she quite surprised me but for the most part miss nightingale's talk was rather earnest inquiring sometimes searching than sparkling or eloquent she is worse than a royal commission to answer said colonel yule and in the most gracious charming manner possible immediately finds out all i don't know younger visitors sometimes felt in awe of her she could flash out a searching question upon a rash generalization as formidably as mr gladstone himself she was interested in everything except what was trivial her intellectual vitality was remarkable visitors who knew nothing of her special interests or pursuits were yet delighted by the stimulating freshness of her talk she liked to keep herself au courant with all that was going on in the political and learned worlds the letters to her from more than one indian viceroy show that the pleasant gossip from the lobbies or the universities with which she relieved her discourses on drains was keenly appreciated if the visitor talked of matters which appealed to her she was instantly curious of detail yes she would say leaning forward and what about this or that and have you thought of doing so and so or if some difficulty were propounded i wonder if i could help you at all the person to speak to is mr a or mr b do you think that he would be so good as to come and see me i am sure he would feel honoured then do you think i might write to him or you will ask him very well then we will see what can be done and so a new network of helpful influence would be made to younger visitors a london clergyman it may be or a student or a budding official she would show something of the maternal solicitude that was conspicuous in her intercourse with nursing daughters but you are not looking well to-day you have been sitting up too late yes then you must promise me to take better care of yourself or are you careful to take regular meals no then you must let an old nurse give you some good advice the humour which was characteristic of miss nightingale came more readily perhaps to her pen than to her tongue but she always enjoyed a joke in conversation even as we have heard already from one of her nursing friends at her own expense sometimes she was teasing a high church young lady once went to south street she was delighted with her interview but miss nightingale she said laughed at high church curates a good deal she said they had no foreheads she sometimes quizzed even her greatest friends she used to talk with humorous indignation of mr jowett's god as a man jelly in contrast with the future life of work which she looked forward to it was in the bedroom above described or in the smaller room in front with which it communicated that the greater part of miss nightingale's life for forty-five years was passed she seldom went out of doors in london it was believed that occasionally at times when her heart and nerves were giving her less than the usual sense of weakness she went out on foot into the park but the belief was only whispered it was a point of honour amongst her circle to respect her house-ridden seclusion
the secret may now be divulged on the authority of many notes from sir harry verney that he lured her out now and then for a morning drive and stroll in the park especially in rhododendron time to remind her of embley as aforesaid miss nightingale except in the few travel years of her youth had little enjoyment from nature in its grander or larger aspects but she knew how to find pleasure in the commoner sights and sounds in flowers and birds and in london skies there was a tree in the garden of dorchester house where the birds used to gather and from which they flew to be fed at miss nightingale's window she had studied the dietary of birds as carefully as of hospital patients and imparted the rudiments of such lore to the dicky bird society in the country she liked to have a view from her bedroom of trees and flowers and often in the early morning watches she wrote down her observations her balcony at lea hurst gave her a great deal of pleasure it is large being the top of the drawing-room bow you see a wide stretch of sky from it and it commands the view described by mrs gaskell at claydon she had her pet birds and squirrels and used to write about them to sir harry's grandchildren she took a great interest in elementary education and insisted almost as much upon the importance of simple nature studies as upon that of physical training on very fine noondays in london she wrote december eighteen eighty eight when there is nearly as much light as there is in a country dusk the storm-like effects of the sun peeping out are more like the light streaming from the glory in heaven of the old italian masters than anything i know and i wonder whether the poor people see it and in old days when i walked out of doors the murky effect at the end of the perspective of a long dull street running e and w was a real peep into heaven i should teach these things in board schools to children condemned to live their lives in the streets of london as i would teach the botany of leaves and trees and flowers to country children cheap popular books were much wanted giving account of the habits structure and characters what they are about not classification of plants as living beings and of birds treated in like fashion and not from the point of view of ornithological classification i had a lovely little popular book with woodcuts published in calcutta she wrote on the plants of bengal the author an englishman offered me to write one on english plants in the same fashion but one of the most popular and enterprising of all our publishers refused on the ground that it would not tell in board school examinations and therefore would not pay End of part seven chapter five home life in south street and the country one two three and four